Well, did you, uh, did you bring your copy of God's Word with you today? Oh, turn with me, if you would, to Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12. It's one of those more difficult books to find. Uh, if you just open your Bible halfway, halfway open, you'll probably get to the book of Psalms. Then go left three doors, Job, Esther, and you will be at Nehemiah. That's a shortcut to Nehemiah's address, okay? Nehemiah chapter 12. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about a, a lifelong theme that, that I've just devoted my life to. And that is a, there is a scarlet thread of redemption that's woven all through Scripture. And I love going to these, uh, going to these hiding places in Scripture and looking for Jesus. Did you know that you should read the Bible and look for Jesus on every single page? And keep reading that page until you see Jesus. And I would made a recent discovery and I've uh, never seen it before and I wanted to share it with you. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27. For the dedication of the new wall of Jerusalem... The Levites throughout the land were asked to, care, to come to Jerusalem to assist in the ceremonies. They were to take part in the joyous occasion with their songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Verse 31. Nehemiah led the leaders of Judah to the top of the wall and organized two large choirs to give thanks. One of the choirs proceeded southward along the top of the wall. Verse 38, the second choir went northward around the other way to meet them. Verse 40, the two choirs that were giving thanks then proceeded to the temple of God where they took their places. Verse 43, this is the climax. Many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day, for God had given the people cause for great joy. Who gave the people great cause? And what emotion were they feeling? For God had given the people cause for great joy. Listen to this. And the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. I've been looking forward to getting to this story for a couple of weeks now. Let's pray together. Jesus, we ask that you help us today to see you from a fresh, new perspective. From one who is a type and shadow of you in the Old Testament. You are our competent restorer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you ever taken on the daunting task of restoring something back to its original condition? When I was a, a young lad, I would go over to my great-grandparents' house from time to time. Now, my great-grandparents were quite old, and they lived in a really old house. And inside that house, there was really old furniture. I mean, it was like walking back into a time warp when I went over to visit them. But up in their storage attic, they had some more really, really, really old furniture that they hadn't brought out in over 50 years. And uh, this furniture was dusty, it was dilapidated, it was useless. And, but since my great-grandparents had had to raise a family through the Great Depression, they never got rid of anything. Well, uh, a few years later, around the time that I was getting engaged to get married to Pam... 
Uh, my, both of my great-grandparents died. We were engaged for a year, and so both of them died during that year. And, and so uh, my parents and my grandparents had to go over to my great-grandparents' house, clean it out, and get it all repaired and ready and, and cleared out for, uh, for resale. And, uh, and my grandfather came to me and said, Grandson, you're the oldest grandson, and, and, um, and we don't have room to, to, to store all this furniture from the attic, but we can't get rid of it. It's got to stay in the family. It was passed down to your great-grandparents from their ancestors, and uh, we don't have room. Your parents don't have room, so you need, to, you need to find use for this furniture. Besides, you're getting married. You need some furniture. True story. And he charged me to keep these heirlooms in the family. Now, I was in a very difficult position here. We only had a small apartment. And, 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 and I didn't know how Pam would want to decorate. And who wants to start out their new life with hand-me-down antiques anyway? Well, as those pieces of antiques sat in my aunt and uncle's garage, and as I looked at them with my names on them, I, something began to happen inside of me, and I began to see them not as they were, but as they could be. I, got a, I, started, I started imagining their potential. I started picturing I, I, I got a vision of what these antiques could become. And I started to feel it. And I cared about it. And, and, and so I'd already done some, some woodworking in my life already at that young life at that point. I'd taken shop and different things at school. And, and so I, I, you know, I knew a little bit about that. And so I began to research, how do you restore antiques? And I, I got into this. I got into this project, and I read all kinds of stuff. This is before internet. And I, I, and I got into it at the library, and that's where they used to have books. And, and, uh, and, I, and I discovered this is, this is what you do to restore antiques. First of all, you buy this stripping agent, and you apply it generously on the furniture, and that, that causes that old, yellowy... Uh, crusty varnish to, to, to flake off, okay? Well, it doesn't flake off. you got to scrape it off. But, but you get all the varnish off, and then you've got to sand it down really, really good with different levels and grades of sandpaper and get it really nice and smooth. And you get it down to its original uh, condition, and, and, then, and then you start to rebuild it back. You put the stain on it, the stain that you envisioned it for and that you want, and the new color you have, and put the stain on it, and and the last thing you do is, is, is you cover it with this polyurethane protectant. And, and, and if you do a good job, it's absolutely beautiful. Now, I had to do this for several pieces. And it took me six long months of a project. I got into this, and, and I'd, go, I'd go leave work in the afternoon, and I would go to my aunt and uncle's house for dinner every single night and I would, I would go into the garage and for hours I would spend on this project restoring this furniture. So uh, when I got married and when I brought my wife home to our apartment, I was so proud of these antiques and I presented them to my wife as a wedding gift. And, and this, was, this has been my heart and soul for you, darling, for the last six months. I've been working on this. And I, and I feel it. I care about these pieces. I mean, I, we're, we're at one together, these pieces, okay? I would work on them. I would, I would I, you know, I'd spend time fixing all the little div divots and, and blemishes in the, in the wood. And, 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 and I'd restored the, you know, gotten new hardware, the knobs and the hinges. And, man, I had worked hard on these. And I'd start to talk to these pieces of furniture. And they, they developed a personality to me. Now, they, I never heard them talk back. Don't, don't go there, okay? But, but I, I cared about these pieces of furniture. I almost named them, okay? I mean, they were, they were like my kids. I cared about it. 
And, 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 and I'd seen a vision about it come to pass, and I, I knew what I was doing because I was, I'd worked on wood before and researched it, and, 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 that, and it, was, it was really, really cool uh, what had happened. And so these old broken down pieces, I was able to, I was able to restore. Now, uh, those pieces are priceless because they were all made in the 1800s. And did you know that Pam and I have been married 35 years and we still have those pieces of furniture? I, I can't let my granddad's words leave me. You've got to keep these in the family. In fact, we, we have several pieces in our house. There's one of them that's prominently displayed in our house right now in our dining area. But we got other pieces in storage. But we, we just couldn't get rid of them. That, that was, uh, it was uh, something that was very, very special to me. But let me, let me talk to you a little bit about the restoration process one more time. Restoration. This is an important word. Restoration. I want you to get this, okay? Restoration means when you take something that is broken down, something that is worn out, it's distressed and it is worthless. And you bring it back to its original condition. And when you do, you restore its value. Now that word restoration is packed full of meaning. Let's go through it one more time. When you take something that is broken down, something that is worn out, distressed, and worthless, and you work hard at it to bring it back to its original condition, and then in doing so, you restore its value. Restoration. And a restorer has to have these qualities, these characteristics. I know this because I've done it. Are you ready? First of all, a restorer's got to care. The characteristics of a restorer is you've got to care, Number two, you've got to have a vision. And number three, you've got to be competent. You've got to care. You've got to have a vision. You've got to be competent. And, and so this is, this is what we see in the leadership of Nehemiah. Let me just uh, share with you a little bit of the background to the text that we read a little bit earlier. Nehemiah lived about 600 years before Jesus Christ. 600 years before Jesus Christ, he's a figure in the Old Testament. And, and the Israelites, and during his lifetime, the Israelites were being oppressed and harassed from all different kind of people groups surrounding them. They were surrounded by enemies that harassed them and oppressed them. For instance, uh, Pharaoh Necho came up from uh, Egypt, from the southwest, came up and and uh, invaded Judah, and conquered Jerusalem, and, and uh, annexed them as a province of the Egyptian empire, and charged them a tribute that really impoverished the people and kept them pushed down. Meanwhile, while they're under the, uh, the thumb of Pharaoh, the surrounding uh, countries were also oppressing them. We're talking about Lebanon, Syria, uh, 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 Edom and Ammon and Moab, that's present-day Jordan, and Philistia, which is present-day outer, uh, the West Bank, uh, not the West Bank, the, uh, anyway, the other, the other little strip of there. Uh, uh, they were also slipping over in the border and, and stealing the livestock and stealing all of the, uh, the animals and, 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 the, and the crops of the people. And so the, the, the poor people were just they were just really, really impoverished by all these enemies. And then to make matters far worse, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, when the Babylonian Empire got strong, he invaded the area and, and conquered uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians and expanded the Babylonian borders uh, beyond Judah. He annexed Judah as, a, as its province of the Babylonian Empire and, and began to extract even more tribute. And so the people were just surrounded by this oppressive enemy that just would never give them any relief. 
Maybe there's some people here that feel a little bit surrounded by all kinds of things that's going on negatively. And it's suffocating. Suffocating. Well, the puppet king of Judah uh, realized that we can't afford this tribute anymore. We can't pay it. It's just killed us. And we're going to stop paying it. And so King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't going to have that. And so he mustered his Babylonian army and came in and invaded Judah again. And uh, they besieged Jerusalem. That means that they surrounded the city outside of its walls, blocked all of its entrances so that no one could get in or out. And they sieged that city for two and a half years. Imagine all the people living inside the walls. Imagine the scarcity of food that quickly happened. For two and a half years, there was no new supply. Some of you are complaining this morning because you couldn't find Halloween candy at the store. Let me just tell you, that ain't nothing compared to what these people are feeling, okay? All right? Uh, we got a few ports that are, that, are, that are a little bit behind on the ships, but this is nothing compared to what these people were facing. And, uh, and so the Bible tells us that the people were starving to death. Inflation skyrocketed. There was no food. People succumbed to cannibalism. It was, it was an awful, awful mess. The Bible tells us all of this. And, and so uh, uh, finally the, the Babylonians came into the city unopposed. Uh, the people could no longer fight. They no longer could resist. People were starving to death. It was a horrible way to live. It was a much more, worse way, a horrible way to die, a languishing death, a slow languishing the Babylonians invaded the city. They pillaged the storehouses of the, of the temple where the, where the nation's treasury were all stored. And then they tore the walls down. They tore down the, the, the massive temple that Solomon had built. It was one of the wonders of the world. They tore down all the houses in the city. And then they put it all to, they torched it all. They burned it all. And so what was left was, was, was uh, just this, um, uh, they, it was just this mound of charred rubble. King Nebuchadnezzar also took all of the wealthy business owners with him to Babylon, took all the skilled artisans with him to Babylon. He only left to live amongst the charred rubble, the poorest and the lowest class of people. There's a few people left. The land was utterly desolate. Nehemiah changed all of their names from Jewish names to Babylonian names and removed their identity as Jewish people. And he also forced the king of Judah. He forced the king of Judah to watch as his entire family was slaughtered in front of him. That was the last scene that the king of Judah saw because then the king of Babylon gouged out his eyes and put him in shackles, shackles that look like this, and made him trudge through the Arabian Desert, the hot, dry Arabian Desert for 1,700 miles from Judah back to Babylon. How far is 1,700 miles? That would be the distance from here to Denver, Colorado. Walking blind in shackles across hot, hot, hot sand for five long months. Once back in Babylon, that blind king of Judah was forced to live a life like a pet. He was forced to sit under the dining table of King Nebuchadnezzar and beg for scraps of food. And he lived that way for the rest of his life. He died in that humiliating condition. The neighboring countries that were surrounding what was left of Judah taunted those poor people living amongst the charred remains. They teased them, they taunted them, they insulted them. Back in Babylon where, where the slaves were taken, uh, they, were, they were also taunted by the Babylonians. You can get a picture of it in Psalm 137. This is scripture, 
Psalm 137, look at what it says. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps. We hung them in the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Ha! Sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? There may be some people here this morning, maybe you're watching online, and you've lost your song. You've lost your song. For the next 150 years, Jerusalem lay in utter ruin. That's long enough for shame and defeat to get deeply established in the Israelites' psyche for several generations. The harsh abuse by the enemy reduced them to absolutely nothing physically, economically, psychologically, politically, and spiritually. Nothing. Can you see the dire condition that Jerusalem was in? Can you, can you feel the dire condition that the people of Jerusalem were in? Can you see it? It was that sad picture that got reported back to somebody who was finally willing to do something about it. They were back in Babylon. There was an Israelite slave who was owned by the king himself. He heard about the desolation of the land. He heard about the impoverishment of the people. And he wanted to do something about it. His name was Nehemiah. The Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 1, it's his memoirs. Let's look at it together. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2 says, One of my brothers came to visit me with some other men. Verse 3, they said to me, Things are not well. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, when I heard this report, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed. Actually, the Bible tells us that he mourned, fasted, and prayed and wept for four long months. The first thing that we see here in this passage is that Nehemiah cared. Nehemiah cared. He was a slave in the, in the king's castle in Susa. He was living high. He was the cupbearer. He got to taste all the food of the king before he got to taste it. He wasn't begging. He was taken very well care of. But he cared. And he risked his very life to go to the king and appeal to the king and ask the king, can I go back with a team and restore the capital of my motherland? And miraculously, the king had favor upon Nehemiah, and the king allowed him to go. Nehemiah cared. But number two, look at, look at what Nehemiah says, uh, 2 says. Verse 11, I arrived in Jerusalem, verse 12, and I had not told anyone about the plans that God had put in my heart. Do you see that? Number two, Nehemiah had a vision. Nehemiah had a God-given picture of a preferable future for Jerusalem. But it wasn't just his idea. It was an idea that God put in his heart. It was plans that God put in his heart. Nehemiah had a vision. 
Nehemiah could see what no one else could see. He saw the potential of what could happen in Jerusalem. Name it Nehemiah 6, verse 15. The wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies heard about it, they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Number three, Nehemiah was competent. Nehemiah was competent. Even though Nehemiah faced enemies from without, even though Nehemiah faced uh, uh, corruption from within, Nehemiah got the job done. Nehemiah knew how to do it. Ver chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 tell us in detail the skillful leadership that Nehemiah exercised. He got the job done. Nehemiah did not just restore the walls. Oh, that was only up to chapter 6. Nehem uh, chapters 7 through 13 tell us how Nehemiah restored the people. Nehemiah restored the city. Nehemiah restored the country. Nehemiah restored their economics. He restored their politics. He restored their infrastructure. He restored it all. He restored their morality. He restored their worship in the temple. Nehemiah restored the people. In other words, in other words, Nehemiah took something that was broken down, something that was worn out, distressed, and worthless. He took the people of Jerusalem, and he took the city of Jerusalem, and he brought it back to its original condition and restored its value as a location on this planet. And did you know that Israel, that Jerusalem became the center stage of the ministry of Jesus 500 years later? Nehemiah was a competent restorer. And that now brings us, all that background brings us to our text today. In Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 43, many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day, for God had given the people cause for great joy, and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. I want to tell you something, church. That's why Psalm 30, verse 11 says, God can turn our mourning into dancing. God turns our mourning into dancing. Whatever somebody might be going through, you could be as distressed as Jerusalem, but God turns our mourning into dancing. Oh, somebody tell us, say, praise Jesus. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah, is a type and shadow of Jesus. Are you starting to see it? Nehemiah is a type and shadow of Jesus. You want to know more about Jesus? Then study the life of Nehemiah. God put Nehemiah in the historical record. God put Nehemiah in the pages of Scripture so that you and me can learn more about our Jesus that we serve. And learn more about what Jesus wants to do in our lives. You see, there are people today. There are people today who are living in shackles. There are people today who feel surrounded by various enemies that want to take them down. Various negative situations that just drain the life out of life. There are people that feel used and abused by a very real enemy, the devil himself. There are people that are living in, in shame and, and humiliation. There are people that, that are suffering desolation physically, desolation economically, desolation psychologically, desolation spiritually. There are people in shackles. They are bound by these vices, these habits, these, these, these ways of life that have plagued our family for generations. They're feeling broken down, worn out, useless, distressed, without worth. This pandemic that we've been through over the last uh, two and a uh, year and a half. This pandemic has exposed those things and brought it to life. Did you know that there are more people 
in Williamsburg suffering mental health issues than ever before in the history of our community. It's a real thing. This is real. Many people feel worse off today than they were before. They're in shackles. The conditions of Jerusalem, the pile charred rubble, is a description of their life. But I'm here to tell you, somebody really, really cares. Come on now. Somebody really has a vision for your situation. Somebody is competent and can overcome whatever that is and restore your life. Oh, somebody take a praise break. That somebody's Jesus. Jesus is our competent restorer. Jesus is our restorer. Jesus can take those shackles off. Jesus can set us free. Look at what, look at what Jesus does. Jesus wants to take your worn out, broken down, distressed, and worthless situation, and he wants to bring you back to your original condition as a created child of God. And he wants to restore your value as a child of God. Wow. Come on. Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares. Look at what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Peter observed Jesus' life firsthand. Jesus, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your worries on Jesus. Why? Why can we do that with confidence? Because He cares. Jesus walked on this earth and, 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 and we hear that we see the stories in the Gospels. Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. Je like Nehemiah wept. Jesus went to the house of Mary and Martha and when, when Lazarus had passed away. And what happened? He wept like Nehemiah wept. Nehemiah was a picture. Jesus is a weeper. Jesus weeps. Jesus is in touch with his feelings. He sees the situation that we get ourselves into, and it moves him. It, he weeps, but he doesn't stay aloof back in the back throes of heaven somewhere. No, he appealed to the Father and said, Father, I will go. And he risked his life. He risked his life. Nehemiah kept his life. Jesus lost his life. And he came because he cares. And he still cares. Number two, Jesus has a vision. He's got a picture of your preferable future. Now, he doesn't see you the way you are. He sees the potential and what you can become. Jesus sees the best in you. And he's got a vision for you. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, for I know, it's a very, very popular uh, scripture where I quote it. For I know the plans that I have for you. They're good plans. They're plans that will give you hope. Plans that will give you a future. People quote that all the time. Did you know they, they actually quote it out of context? Do you want to know the context of that verse? You want to know the context of that verse? Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem before the Babylonians came. He was a prophet in those last days of Jerusalem. And, and he prophesied that doom and destruction was coming soon to the city of Jerusalem. Well, that infuriated the king so much that the king threw Jeremiah in prison. Read it through Jeremiah. You'll see it. Jeremiah was thrown into prison, and, and he languished in that dungeon. And you know what? Sure enough, the king of Babylon did come and besieged the city. Everything got really, really bad. Imagine how bad it got in the dungeon. And, and, and the king finally came in and invaded Jerusalem, sacked it all to the ground, and burned it all, and he released Jeremiah from prison. And that aging prophet spent the rest of his days living amongst those charred ruins of Jerusalem, amongst the poorest and the lowest class people. Jeremiah never got to go to Babylon. He stayed there. And it was in the midst of those charred ruins. It was in the midst of the poorest of the poor. 
It was in the midst of all the other nations around them, taunting them and humiliating them and insulting them. It was in that situation that Jeremiah rose up and prophesied again. For I've got plans for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to be good to you. Plans to give you a future. Plans to give you a hope. It was in that worst, worst situation that Jeremiah prophesied those words. Now, it would be 150 years later before they ever came true. But I want to tell you something, church. They did come true. The Word of God came true. Here's what I want to leave with you today. The God who had plans for Israelites in their worst situation is the same God who has plans for His people today in their worst situations. Number three, Jesus is our competent restorer. Jesus knows what he's doing. Jesus left the throne room of heaven. He came and walked among us. He gave his life for us. And 1 Peter 5.10 says this. Look at this. After you have suffered a little while, (laughs) we all suffer a little while. After you have suffered a little while, Jesus will what? Restore you. Jesus will restore you. Jesus will take what you have, your broken down, worn out, distressed, worthless self, and bring you back to your original condition and restore your value as a child of God. Now, isn't that amazing? That's the Jesus we serve. That's the Jesus we serve. He is our competent restorer. Aren't you glad we serve Jesus? Aren't you glad for Jesus? Aren't you glad for Jesus? There may be some folks here to say, you know what, I've been running from Jesus because I just didn't want to submit. And you're realizing now, wow, in my self-directed life, I have made a mess of things. And it's not worth me hanging on to the reins of my own life. I need Jesus to lead my life. And maybe you're here today and say, you know what, I want to surrender totally to Jesus. This message is actually for you watching online you've run your own life and you've run it into the uh, run it amok you realize you've made messes and you realize now that Jesus if your life was in Jesus's hands and you totally surrendered he would make a lot better life for you and I want to invite you right now if you would just surrender to Jesus would you bow your heads with me in the room Would you bow your heads with me? No one looking around, every eye closed, every head bowed. This is a very intimate moment. If that's you and say, you know what? I want to totally surrender to Jesus. I want to give my life to my competent restorer. I want him to restore my life. I need Jesus. If you're ready to totally surrender and invite Jesus into your life, would you just lift your hand real quick? Just let raise your hand. I just want to close in prayer. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see you. You can put your hand down. I can. I see you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I, can, I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. This is a, a moving moment. The Holy Spirit is just walking up and down the aisles, just touching people, gently, gently laying his hand on your shoulder and saying, would you like to come home? Anybody else? I'm just going to close in prayer one, one more time. I just want to scan the congregation one more time. Those of you, I I already saw your hand. Thank you. You can put your hand down, sir. Thank you. Anybody else watching online? Watching online. If you would just take a moment right now, just in your living room or wherever you're watching, just raise your hand. Take a step. Take a step and say, I want to do this. I want to surrender to Jesus. Would you follow with me in prayer? Can we all repeat this prayer after after we see these folks that raise their hand aren't, aren't standing out? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I have run my own life. I admit that I've run my own life. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in your competence. I believe in your competence. I believe in your restoration. I believe in your restoration. 
So I surrender to you. So I surrender to you. I confess my sin. I confess my sin. I confess my need of you. I confess my need of you. And now I decide. And now I decide to follow you. To follow you. The rest of my life. The rest of my life. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.